All right, all right, all right. Hey, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Come on, happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. Can we give it up one time for the woman who did it all for you? Amen, amen. Hey, before we get going any further, I, I know some of you may not know exactly uh, who we are. Maybe it's one of your first times here. I just want to let you know um, that God brought you here for a reason. I believe that from the bottom of my heart, that God has a message of hope, encouragement, and love. He wants to speak into your life today, and you are here not by accident. You're here to hear that message that God has been drawing you here to hear. Can I get an amen on that? Amen means let it be done, and amen can also mean I believe that. I believe that, and we can, we can have all the, the scripture taught over us. We can have all the words uh, spoken to us, but at one point in our life, we're going to have to say amen. I believe it. I believe it, and that's, that's true for me. So my name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Give it up for yourselves one time, because Lifeline is pretty awesome, and I like it a lot. Um, before we get started in the message today, I just want to let you know about uh, one, one kind of cool thing we're doing. Uh, you may have noticed the pop-up outside. That's our life group pop-up. Man, there's no name for that pop-up, but that's what I'm calling it today. It's a, it's a life group pop-up, and if you're interested at all or just want to find out more about starting, leading, or even hosting a life group, we know that life is better together. In fact, we put it right there on the wall so that you can know when you get bored of my message, you can look over and start reading stuff that we believe in, so at least you're getting something, but that's the life group tent out there, and if you're interested at all in, in leading a life group or hosting one, maybe just hosting one in your home is as much as you got right now, go ahead and stop in on your way out today, and, and our friendly neighborhood staff will bring you up to speed on everything we got there. You guys ready to hear the word today? Amen. Well, that's pretty nice of you. That's awesome. Hey, you know what? Uh, we're in a series called Frequently Asked Questions, and there are some questions that, as a pastor, I, I hear more frequently than other questions. Uh, we dealt with, what about the spiritual world? You can go back and listen about that, like angels, demons, heavens, hell. What's up with all that? A couple weeks ago, we dealt with that. Last week, my beautiful, stunning, powerful wife taught a message about what does it mean to be, I got a little carried away right there. It is Mother's Day after all. I'm like, mm, feeling a little extra on it. But she taught last week about how do I know I'm saved? What does it mean to be saved? Every time the altar call comes, I feel like raising my hand again. So Talk to me a little bit about what it means to be saved. But this week, I believe, has the power to really change the way we look at life and especially the people around us because today's message is about how do I deal with difficult people. Ooh, y'all like, were you spying on my Facebook? Were you looking at everything I'm going through right now? I assure you I was not. I got ready for this message like weeks ago. But it just, because every anytime I want to bring it up or talk about this issue, how to, how to deal with difficult people, you'd be like, how did he know? <laughs> how did he know I'm dealing with that? Because it's an issue that we face on a regular basis. But if we can learn a little bit about what it's like to, to try and be at least a little godly about how to deal with difficult people, that would help. Because maybe some of you have wondered, like I have, how am I supposed to be a good Christian person or a decent human being, for that matter, with all these crazy people in my life? Has anyone else ever said, I'm a pastor, I'm just being vulnerable with you, though. Like, I thought that stuff because I got, you have contestant number one who never does what they say they're going to do, and they, like, they make life more complicated than it needs to be for you. Don't raise your hand if that's... For that person is in your life right now. You got contestant number two who is gunning for your job and gossiping behind your back, stressing you out to the max. And then I got contestant number three who is constantly demanding my time and attention, has completely unrealistic expectations of me, refuses to take no for an answer, looks me square in the eye and says, I just pooped my diaper, change me. I'm like, I can't escape all these difficult people in my life. This is crazy. And if you feel like me, and sometimes I feel like, I swear, I'm about to lose my witness on somebody. I'm about to, everything I've been working hard for this whole time, I'm about to lose it all because this crazy person in my life. I got a quick story about this. Um, this one's close to home for me, but I thought, hey, why not share it? This is what everybody else is dealing with. Might as well share it with y'all. Um, several years ago, when Tiffany and I first started uh, passing the church, it probably was a year or two in, uh, there was a gentleman that, uh, let me just read it so I don't, I don't butcher it. He had a bit of an anger issue, and he expressed his anger verbally 
to me and to other pastors and to other people here at the church and a few folks around here, and it got back to me. And for your information, part of my job here is to keep this a safe place. And my, I'm, as a shepherd, as a pastor, my goal and my job is to lead, feed, and protect the people who God has put in me. So I'm like, okay, heard about, you know, some, some aggression going back and forth, and I had to go, sorry. And I don't know how some of y'all feel about that, but this is, this is part of my role. Like, I got to keep this place safe. I have to keep this place safe so that you know you can bring your friends, you can bring your family, and they're going to be safe too. And that's part of my job. It's part of my responsibility. And let's just say I talked with that person, and that conversation went about as good as I thought it would go. All right? It was like about as good as I thought it would go with anybody with an anger issue. So long after that, story's not over, long after that, um, me and my 12-year-old son at the time, we were going to our favorite spot, Taco Bell. Man, it's our favorite spot. I know I got a lot of Taco Bell loyals up in here, you man. Man, put me, a, put me one of those grill stuff burritos right now. We'll put the message on pause right now. I don't care what time it is. When Tiffany's not in town, we're at, we're at Taco Bell at like 1030 in the morning. So don't even worry about it. So we go to Taco Bell, me and my 12-year-old son, and here comes homeboy walking down the city. so he's coming our way and we're walking in the door and this guy starts screaming and cussing so hard I thought he was going to start foaming from the mouth I was like speechless I was absolutely speechless and for a preacher that's a big deal I had nothing to say for once in my life I was absolutely speechless but you know I wasn't always a preacher you know, <laughs> you know some of you know my my testimony but I wasn't always a preacher. I started, to get, I started to get thoughts in my mind, you know. Talk about lose your witness. I was like, I'm about to, I'm about to respond to this issue in the, in the most instinctive way possible. But then I started imagining the headlines. Local pastor kills a man outside of Taco Bell. And I thought, you know what? Better not. <laughs> Better not do that. I guess I'll just go in and get a chalupa. But, you know, I just decided to move on. But you know what? There are times in our lives when you just can't walk away. You know what I'm saying? You, you just can't walk away from a difficult person. You ever been in a situation like that where, man, I'd love to just walk away, but I can't. This person's in my life. This person's in my sphere. This person's in my circle, and I have to deal with this. And we want to know. I, I know I do, so I'm just assuming you do. I want to know how to deal with difficult people when they come into my life. So, there are arenas you can't avoid people that are difficult. And there are times that you're not such a bowl of sunshine yourself. <laughs> Y'all looking at me like, yes, huh? I'm good. No, I'm not anybody else's difficult person. All right, it's Mother's Day. I'll give that to you. Fine, fine. So let's just imagine that only other people are difficult. Not you. Ne never you. But let's listen to what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 23, bum, bum, bum. he says, Again, I say, don't get involved with foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, and patient with, say it with me, difficult people. Must be patient with difficult people. Difficult people show up everywhere in our lives, but let's address some of the different locations that we find difficult people in our lives. If you got your notes, you can write this in. Place number one is at work. At work. Let's talk about difficult people at work. Oh, the best difficult people are at work, I think. I think some of the best are. Let's start where it's really fun, shall we? Who has a job? Come on, raise your hand at me if you had a job. Raise your other hand if you need a job. Raise both hands if you want a different job, man. I'm just like, okay, I got one. I don't need one, but I want a different one. Okay, so pretty much everyone here. And a, usually a bad work environment stems from people problems. Anybody got people problems? People problems are what cause bad work environments, especially difficult bosses. And I should know I've been a difficult boss before. So I know that that is a major issue. I like this true story from the Bible, and by the way, all these stories are true from the Bible, about David and Saul. When it comes to workplace and authority and respecting authority and, you know, because this is, this is a major issue in all of our lives, we all face this. So I, I like this story, and I go back to it often for my own self to get myself on track, to make sure I'm like David, 
David was a man after God's own heart. And I, I go back to this story. This story is out of 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18, starting in verse 7. Let me set the context. Uh, Saul was Israel's first king, and David was a shepherd who played a harp and watched over sheep. And then David killed Goliath. Y'all heard of that one? David killed Goliath, but then Israel started to like David better than they liked Saul because he was the man, and he was like their hero. And so he did really good in their eyes, and so people started to sing songs like this. This was their song. Saul killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Man, somebody be singing a song like that about you? Well, you kind of good, but that person over there, they're real good. I mean, how would that make anybody feel? Pretty bad. This made Saul very angry. What's this, he said. They credit David with 10,000s and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Watch this. As soon as Saul let bitterness and jealousy into his life, watch what happened right after that. A tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul. As soon as we let bitterness and jealousy and discontentment and that kind of ill feelings. You know, you know how you feel about people sometimes? As soon as we let that take hold and we say, oh, yeah, this is how I'm going to feel about it, we get tormented. It torments us. And that person doesn't even know they're messing with you. But you over here suffering. And you're like thinking about it all the time. You're tormented about it and they don't even know. You got David over here like, doo, doo, doo. he don't know. But Saul, he's got a tormenting the Bible calls it a spirit, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul. And he began to rave in his house like a madman, like my, like my homeboy from, from Taco, raving like a madman. David was playing the harp as he did each day, but Saul had a spear in his hand. And suddenly he hurled it at David, intending to pin him against the wall. But David escaped twice. Hold up. Your boss ain't as bad as David's boss because you haven't got, tried to get murdered yet. Has your boss tried to kill you literally yet? Well, then you don't have it as bad as David did, but David's kind of, he needs to catch up a little bit because it said he escaped twice. Let me explain what that means to you. I mean, he's escaped, came back, and escaped again. His boss is throwing a spear, intending to pin him against the wall. So I don't know what kind of problems you think you're going through at work. They ain't like these problems. But watch, watch what happens right after that. This is crazy stuff. Saul was frightened after that of David. He was then frightened of David, for the Lord was with David and had turned away from Saul. See, Saul had bought into the lie. He bought into the bitterness. He bought into the, well, uh, he's just, uh, he's, he's after me. He doesn't like me. He got into that, and he, got, he started to be overcome with fear. And see how it goes from, it goes from torment, from bitterness to jealousy, then it moves into fear. It's very interesting to me. Finally, Saul sent him away and appointed him commander over a thousand men. Say, what? (laughs) Wait a second. I thought you hated this guy. But then he got appointed commander over a thousand men. Then David, this is the key. This is the whole key part right here. David faithfully, everyone say faithfully. He faithfully led his troops into battle. David continued to succeed in everything he did for the Lord was with him. He was faithful and the Lord was with him. Say it with me. He was faithful, then the Lord was with him. It's a key that we need to remember in our lives. David's faithfulness caused the Lord to stay with him, which led to success, even though his boss was mean. Difficult people at the workplace. That's what we're talking about. But when he stayed faithful, that's when things started to go well for him. Saul, on the other hand, let his jealousy and bitterness control him, which led to suffering. Now listen, David's difficult people problem That was a mouthful. I practiced that. David's difficult people problem never went away. But if you keep reading that story, you will find that David never slandered his king. Never slandered his king. In fact, David's own men, his own homeboys, his own people would come up to him and say, hey, man, Saul ain't right. Man, Saul ain't right to you. You're the rightful king. You're the one who should be in charge around here. You're the one who should be over this crew. You're the one who should be in charge. Let's go get him. And David would say, you shut it up right now. He refused. He didn't even allow anybody around him to talk bad about his king, the anointed one, the one who he was under the authority of. 
Man, that is, I don't know about y'all, but that's crazy. That's, come on, that's crazy. Try and picture that in your own life. Your boss is mean. And everybody on the whole crew knows you're the one who should be in charge. And they come up to you and they say, man, oh, you, you ought to do this. And you say, you know what? I'm going ha- to go ahead and stop you right there. Because that's our boss you're talking about. That's the person who's in, that's the person who hired us. That's the person who, whatever. That's the person who we're supposed to be respecting. And I refuse to engage in bitterness and jealousy because I know what that's going to lead to. Instead, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be faithful. I know this is a tall order. I know this is crazy. But I'm just telling you from experience. See, I used to work in food service. Come on, somebody. Anybody ever work in food service or retail or anybody, anywhere where you got to be with people day in and day out? And these folks, they just love to talk, all right? They love to talk. They love to talk to their customers. They love to talk about their customers. They love to talk to their coworkers. They love to talk about their coworkers. They love to talk to their boss. They love to talk about their boss. But let me just tell you, from experience, I've seen this, and it's the people who like to talk the most you know what I'm saying, the negative stuff, the, the slandering stuff, the gossiping stuff. It's the people who talk the most that always have the most problems in their life. Man, if we just would have read this story earlier in life, I could have learned something. And I could have stayed ahead of that. Listen to this. Man, people who talk the most trash, they always, I got I to gotta tell you this though. It's like there's a universal law written somewhere that we can read and and. and it says we reap what we sow. Man, it's like there's this law in effect that we can't see that always the people who are talking the most are having the most issues in their life. Write this down in your notes. This is, this is a key to dealing with difficult people in the workplace. I don't care if they're your boss, if they're your coworkers, or if they work under you. This is the key. The key to dealing with difficult people in the workplace is to remain faithful and speak positively. Ooh, come on, somebody. Stay faithful and speak positively because we will all and we all have opportunities I'm going to use air quotes on that we have opportunities to get back at or assassinate the character of the people we work with who are difficult I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart don't give in to that temptation it's from the enemy and he's trying to mess you up don't give in to that temptation of the opportunity to talk bad about someone else remaining faithful with difficult people at work means speaking in a positive way when they're not around, especially when they're not around, because that's when the opportunities come up. I like to call it ministering in the opposite spirit. This is what I like to, to tell people to do. This is what I remind myself to do, to minister in the opposite spirit. That means when someone speaks negatively about you, you speak positively about them. That's what David did. Saul tried to kill him with a spear, like shot at him, but he still twice, thank you, over and over again, but still he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't slander his king, and he wouldn't let anybody else slander his king. That means when someone speaks negatively about you, you speak positively about them. If someone is prideful, you get humble. If someone's greedy, you get, ge- ge- uh, you get generous. And if you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian today, I, I, this probably doesn't make any sense to you, does it? I'll be honest with you, I'm a Christian, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. <laughs> But it sounds like the dumbest advice ever. Like, how could that possibly work? How could that possibly work? But if we read that story in 1 Samuel all the way to the end, it does work. It does work. When we minister in the opposite spirit, when we say, you know what, that person's talking trash on me, but I refuse to engage in gossip against them. That's how I deal with difficult people at work. The cool part about becoming a Christian and reading the Bible, it's like you get secret cheat codes to life that are counterintuitive and nobody would naturally do that, then you try it and it changes everything. That's the cool part. It's like you get this rule book. You're like, man, I didn't even know. People like to talk about rules, like the Bible has rules and God has rules and it's like a bad thing. But no, it's like, no, if you do this, watch what will happen. It's a good thing. And we get on the inside track on that, and that's a beautiful thing because we want, I know we all want to know, man, how can I deal with these difficult people? Again, the key to dealing with difficult people at work is to remain faithful and speak positively. All right, let's talk about place number two. This is where it gets fun. Place number two, write this in your notes, at home. Don't raise your hand, everybody. It's Mother's Day. Be nice. It's not you. 
It's not you. Don't raise your hand. But some of you might have some difficult people to deal with at home. Maybe definitely not your spouse. No, no, that would never happen. Definitely not your kids. No, maybe your parents. I can see that happening. Maybe the in-laws, man, wherever it happens. But at home can be a really sticky situation when you're, when you're faced with difficult people. Difficult people. But this is one place where we find some of the strongest language in the Bible. I don't know if any of you read this scripture I'm about to read, but this is some of the strongest language that, I, that I've found that the Bible has to say about us, those of you who are believers, those of you who have signed up for this and said, yeah, I'm a Christian, I believe in God. Well, listen to what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5. But those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> when I read that, I was getting ready for this, and I read that, I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> like, that sounds a little strong. And Tiffany just did a message last week about how do I know I'm truly saved. Now I got some of you going, well, I have problems with people in my own household. Does that mean I'm not saved anymore? Now hang on, just wait, just wait. If you can't, <laughs> here's the thing. God, this is what I really want to say. God stayed amazingly committed to us in our brokenness. He stayed amazingly committed to us in our brokenness. The word says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That when we were messy, when we were messing up, when we were saying things we shouldn't say, when we were doing things we shouldn't do, when we were going places we shouldn't be, when we were doing everything we shouldn't do, Christ said, oh, yeah, I'd die for that. Oh, yeah, I'd die for you. Oh, yeah, I'd give everything for you. He stayed amazingly committed to us through all our brokenness. And I think all that God is trying to say to you and me is like, hey, just be like me. I did it for you. Can you do it for them? I stayed amazingly committed to you in everything you went through. Can you do it for them too? Can you just do it for your family? Can you hang in there for your family? He's saying, be like me. He's committed to you for life, thick and thin. He asks us to be the same way with our family. Um, I got a story about my, my wife and I uh, getting, uh, getting together. And because and when I first came to this church, my first church, by the way, first church I ever started attending. And I don't know how this happened, but I don't know. I just came here, and it was a good place for me to be. And I came here, and I'm like, I looked up on the platform, and there was this cute blonde girl playing guitar. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is a place for me right now. Look at that. And I married that girl, you know. And we started to get, we started to get close, and we became friends. And then we started, as Christians say, courting, you know, because we were both kind of leaders. And so our counsel was to, everybody was telling us, you know, keep, keep, it, on the, keep it on the down low. So, you know, we, 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 we kept our relationship Close to the chest, you know, not, not close to her chest, but close to like, close to the chest. Oh, I'm saying a lot of things right now. Oh, my gosh. I, it was just, it was, it was incognito, all right? It was an incognito relation. We were just keeping it. Whew. All right, hang on. All right, hang on. Slow, slow down a little bit. Um, so we didn't make our relationship public until, you know, we were engaged. Am I blushing right now? This is crazy. But one thing that Tiffany shared with me uh, when we were dating, when we were in that phase, and it was like she was sharing with me how committed she was planning to be. She said something to me that, that I've never forgotten. I've never heard it this way. Um, but she said it to me, and it, it made a big difference. She said, hey, when we, when we start fighting, you know, because when you're dating, man, you ain't fighting. When you're right after you get married for like the next year, you ain't fighting. Uh, you, you think you might be fighting, but you ain't fighting yet. Just, just wait, young ones. Just wait. Seven years. I know it's, some of you have been like... Married way longer than that, but I know a thing or two by now. And, man, you ain't fighting for nothing. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just saying I'm a human being, and I'm letting you know we fight just like anybody else. But Tiffany knew that. She's smarter than me. Our wives are smarter than us, guys. Just, just face it. Just face it. Say it. <laughs> I'm giving you something really useful right now. You should be writing this down. But she said to me, she said, hey, when we start fighting, don't bring up that word. I was like, what word are you talking about? Y'all know what word I'm probably talking about. It's the D word. She said, she said to me, don't even go there. Not ever. Not, don't use that as ammunition. Like, 
And since we were so far back in our relationship, I thought it was so strange. It was so strange that she would speak about that. But I guess, you know, back home for her, I don't, I don't know why she brought that up. But she, I, I, never, I never did. By the grace of God, I never did. And I know that uh, this might be a, an issue for some of us because we have gone there and we have even done that. But, but Tiffany was, was showing me part of God's heart is that it's not even in the cards. It's not even in the cards. Like, just like our relationship with the Lord, we can walk away from it freely, but he is committed to you. He's committed to you 100%. There is not even a sliver of him that's saying, oh, yeah, no way, no way. Did too much, gone too far. We can walk away from that relationship, but he's saying, I never will. And, and it was like Tiffany was, was speaking to me through the, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me through Tiffany. Like, that's the commitment level I, I want you to have with me and I'm prepared to have with you. Here's a key, a key to dealing with difficult people at home. This is not just for your spouse. This is not just for your kids, not just for your parents. Anybody in your household, this is your family we're talking about. The key to dealing with difficult people at home is to love through the fights and commit for life. Because let me just tell you, fights are going to happen with family and they're going to be saucier than any other fight. Because they know stuff about you that nobody else knows. And they know all the dirt. They know where the bodies are hidden. They know what you've done. They know what you've said. And so those fights can get a little hairy. So I'm just, I'm just warning you. You already know this. But I'm letting you know the key to dealing with difficult people at home is to love through the fight. Just be ready for it. Like Tiffany with me. I had rose-colored glasses. I'm like, this girl, she can do no wrong. She's never going to hurt my feelings. She's never going to do anything. But she's like, hey, it's going to happen. But when it does, I want you to know I'm in it. I'm in it. And, man, I would love for us all to have that attitude with our families, to love through the fights and commit for life. Commit for life. So let's talk about place number three. Place number three. I can't possibly talk about all the different places that we find difficult people. I'm just going to choose the ones that, that I think are the most pertinent for us today. And so let's talk about this third one. Place number three. This is in your notes. Write this in. With friends. With friends. There's that game called Words with Friends. Well, this time it means something a little different. When you got words for your friends. Words with friends. Now, when you have difficult friends, because sometimes friends are less than friends. Friends let us down sometimes. It just happens because we're all human beings. And we have shortcomings and we, and we do things a little bit wrong. They, they misunderstand. They misinterpret. They misjudge. And when, thing, and when we're going through moments in life where we need them the most, they act like Job's friends. Now, when I was first getting saved, I thought that was the book of Job. And so I flipped to the book of Job because that's what I needed. So I flipped over to Job and said, there is nothing about getting a job in here. This is about how to lose a job. I don't like this. It's, the, it's Job. Job. Right in the middle of your Bible, book of Job. And sometimes our friends act more like his friends. See, they're good at first. All of our friends are nice at first. Job 2, 13. Look at his nice friends. They sat on the ground with him for seven days and nights. No one said a word to Job, for they saw that his suffering was too great for words. See, because Job, he lost his house. He lost all of his kids. They all died. He lost all of his possessions, all of his wealth, all of his life. He lost everything. And his friends, at first, for seven days at least, they didn't say anything because they, they thought, oh, man, this is crazy. I'm just going to be a friend right now, sitting, sitting Shiva. I'm just going to sit right there and, and do that. So at first they were really nice. They were supporting him. Then a man named Zophar, one of the three friends, and they all said some pretty fun stuff. I'm just going to pick the one that I thought was the funnest. Job 11, verse 6. This is what Job's friend said to him. Listen, God is doubtless punishing you far less than you deserve. What, what are you talking about, friend? I'm going to tell you how friendly I would be in that moment. I'd have that old man rising up in me, be like, I'm not going to act like Job in that moment. I'm going to act like, so far, come here. I think you got something on your face right now. I'm going to get it off of there. What you talking about? Less than I deserve. Lost all my kids. Lost my house. Lost my, less than I deserve? Like, what do you really think of me, Zophar? Tell me more. This is crazy. He's saying, Zophar was saying, no, it's all your fault. Friend, it's all your fault. You sinned. You messed up. You're a loser. 
Lost your family, lost your house, all your possessions, all your life saving. That's all your fault. <laughs> this is, I get worked up just reading someone else's story about that. Imagine if that was you. And some of you might feel that way. You got a friend that's being a little less than a friend right now. He's like, Job's over there saying, thanks, buddy. It's one thing for a pastor to tell us something you don't want to hear. Man, that happens all the time. It's one thing for a parent to tell you something you don't want to hear. Man, that happens all the time. But a friend? Man, they're supposed to have my back, right? Isn't that right? They're supposed to have my back. This can be very difficult because unlike our family, we picked these people to be our crew. This is my posse. This is my my crew, these people are supposed to have my back, thick and thin. These are my friends, my family I was born into, but I chose you to be my friend. How could you do me like that? And when they treat us in a way that's not fair or not right, it can hurt a lot. Listen to what Proverbs 18, 24 says. A man who has friends must himself be friendly. Man, that's, that's, that sounds really key to me because it means like, if, if you want to be a person that has good friends, It says the emphasis is on how I am as a friend. How I am as a friend. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. What that means is this. It means that when you have a good friend, it can be more of a lifeline to you than your own family. Some of you have experienced this because sometimes family's not as awesome as they should be. I know that many of you have faced that, that your family has let you down in a lot of really special ways. And there are friends in your life that have actually taken the place of family. And that's actually biblical. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's supposed to be. There are friends that we've chosen that we make covenants with. We make, like, solemn agreements with that. I'm here for you. I'm he- Marriage is a picture of that. But it can also happen with our, with our crew. We can look at um, Jonathan and David. I don't have time to preach about that, but David and Jonathan were friends with each other, and they made, co- they made covenant together, and they were closer. So Jonathan was closer to David than he was with his own father because his father was raving like a madman. Some of y'all got a father like that. Not a mother, though, because your mothers are, are, it's Mother's Day, okay? Mothers, you, you get a pass on that. But when I was growing up, I, I had a best friend. I had a best friend growing up. His name was Manuel. I called him Mani. Now, I know the last story I told you all about a friend I had, he didn't, he didn't live. But this friend is alive. He's okay. My, my last friend I told you about, it was a really sad story. This story is not sad. Uh, it, my, my friend Mani, he's doing fine. But we were best friends growing up, man. He was my absolute best friend. Raise your hand if you had a best friend growing up. Come on. Andrew. A lot of you. That's really great. But I, I, had, I had friends, but there was one friend that stuck closer than a brother, and he was that. Now, I can remember he had the pool. He only lived a couple houses down, and I would walk over there, and we would jump in the pool. I mean, we're t- I'm talking since I was two years old. We were friends. We were joined at the hip, me and Monty, and we would jump in that pool. We would jump out, and we would lay on the concrete and let the sun cook us, you know, and dry us all off. You know, you got memories like that with your best friend with your best friend, staying up all hours of the night, playing regular Nintendo. Some of you kids in here are like, what, like a Wii? No, not like a Wii. Like, like the original Mario, okay? Only two buttons on that thing. is black and red controller. Google it. You'll find it. They're playing regular Nintendo all hours of the night. I was tweaking even back then with a two liter of Pepsi up all night, feeling good about it too. Me, oh, me and my friend. Me and my friend. I loved him. I loved him. I still do. We loved each other. We were best friends. But then in my life, I started to to drift away. I started to make poor choices. I started to go that way in life, and I became a bad friend. It wasn't him. It was me. I became a bad friend. I started to choose other things over my friend. I started spending less time with him. I started spending more time with these other friends. You know what I'm saying? And I neglected and even abused that relationship. And like a good friend would, he cut me off. He said, Elliot, I can't, I can't even be around you anymore. You're not even the same person I used to know. I can't be around you. I can't let you into my life. I can't let you into my family's life. Because as, as we became adults, this was still true. I didn't even get to go to my own best friend's wedding Because I was so out of control. I didn't even get to see my own best friend get married. But you know what? He he did what a good friend would do. He never stopped loving me. He never stopped honoring me. And he loved me. 
But he said, you know what? You're out of line. He was a good friend to me. He never abandoned me. And that's the kind of friend I want to be for others. Because people with friends, we need to be friendly. Like the Bible says. So I need to know, what does it mean to be friendly? I, I want to be like my best friend, Monty. I wish he was right here right now, watching online or something. Firm, yet faithful. Truthful, not hiding the real issues, but sticking closer than a brother and holding on to hope for me like I might come back. Listen, that relationship is restored. We live far away from each other now. We don't get to see each other very much, and we, we comment on each other's pictures of our kids and whatnot, but I'll be honest, man, I damaged that relationship. I damaged it. I want to be a good friend. I want to make up for loss. I want to be a good friend. You want to you know the key to dealing with difficult friends? Write this in your notes. Be the kind of friend that you want to have. Be the kind of friend. Be the kind of person you want your friend to be. That's the way I wrote it. Be the kind of person that you want your friend to be. Because it's not about what everybody else is doing. Hey, they're not here right now. You are here right now. And there are things that you can do. And in fact, that's the most important thing is you can be the person that God has called you to be. Be the friend that God has asked you to be. It's important not to lose hope in people too quickly. Prove to your friends that that you love, that you are the person that you say you are by taking the high ground and being loyal and showing honor through the emotions of a difficult situation. Because difficulties happen. Fights happen. You're going to face difficulties with your friends, and it's important for you. It's kind of like the same thing throughout every place we meet difficult people. It's on you. Are you going to take the high ground, or are you going to succumb to the emotions and get angry? Say things you regret. Do things you regret. Or are you going to take the high ground and say, you know what? No, I'm going to be a good worker right now, a good co-worker, a good employee. I'm going to be a good husband. I'm going to be a good wife. I'm going to be a good son. No, I'm going to be a good friend. And I'm going to remain faithful even though things are difficult right now because we live in such an honorless culture. Honorless, man. We're so quick to dishonor one another, to disrespect one. It's in our culture to do so. You know, talking bad about your boss, talking bad about the other can presidential candidate talking about it's just built in we talk trash it's it's built into our culture and so it's very easy for us i'm not saying it's not going to be difficult i'm saying it's going to be beneficial i'm saying it might save you from really really hard times in your life if you can rise above the culture that says it's all right to talk like that it's all right oh they did you wrong yeah you need to get them. You need to say that about them. You need to really stick it to them. You want to know how Job's story ends? God comes and he comes to Job's defense and rebukes those friends of him, of his, but not before rebuking Job. Did you know that's how Job's story ends? People like to think, oh, yeah, Job's friends, man, they're all bad. But Job got it too. God came right to him and said, you don't know what's really going on. You don't know. It was mutual. And when it comes to difficult people, it's often mutual. I'm going to let that marinate for a second. It's often mutual. And when we're looking at a difficult person in our life, sometimes that can be a mirror back on us being like, all right, what do I need to deal with in my life? What is God trying to grow me in? What, how is God dealing with me in this? Because how I respond, how I react, how I face difficult people says more about me than it does about them. Oh, boy. I just said a mouthful. I hope some of you got that. But be the person to your friend that, that you want them to be. I got a closing thought uh, on this topic of dealing with, with difficult people. Because there's something we need to understand about difficult people. There's a story of um, a man named Stephen Covey wrote in a book called um, Seven Habits to Highly Effective People. I really like the book myself. It's better than it sounds. <laughs> um, but there's a story in there that is a true story of him uh, on a subway in New York. I'll just read it to you. Stephen said this, dealing with a difficult person. I remember a mini paradigm shift I experienced one Sunday morning. A paradigm is just a way we view things. It's a, it's a point of view. It's like how we see the world, a paradigm, our point of view. 
He had a paradigm shift. I experienced one Sunday morning on a subway in New York. People were sitting quietly, some reading newspapers, some lost in thought, some resting with their eyes closed. It was a calm and peaceful scene. Are you there? Can you see it? It's on the subway. It's nice and calm. There's the roar of the, of the subway outside, but it's pretty quiet inside. Nobody's really talking. Then suddenly, a man and his children entered the subway car. The children were so loud and rambunctious and bouncing off the walls that instantly the whole climate changed. The man sat down next to me and closed his eyes. <laughs> Apparently oblivious to the situation, the children were yelling back and forth, throwing things, even grabbing people's newspapers. It was very disturbing. And yet the man sitting next to me did nothing. It was difficult not to feel irritated. I would have said it a different way. I could not believe that he could be so insensitive to let his children run wild like that and do nothing about it, taking no responsibility at all. It was very easy to see that everyone else in the subway felt irritated too. So finally, with what I felt was unusual patience and restraint, this is a true story by the way, I turned to him and said, sir, your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you couldn't control them a little more. Like I said, I probably would have said it a different way. This is a pretty nice guy, apparently. The man lifted his gaze as if to come to consciousness of the situation for the first time and said softly, oh, you're right. I guess I should do something about it. We just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago. And I don't even know where I am. I don't even know what to think. And I guess my kids don't know either. He goes on to write, can you imagine what I felt in that moment? <laughs> don't you feel like a bit of a dirtbag right there? I know I would. My paradigm shifted. The way I viewed the situation changed. Suddenly, I saw things differently. And because I saw things differently, I thought differently. I felt differently. I behaved differently. My irritation vanished. I didn't have to worry about controlling my anger or my attitude anymore because my heart was filled with the man's pain. Feelings of sympathy and compassion flowed freely. Your wife just died. I'm so sorry. Can you tell me about it? What can I do to help? With one simple piece of knowledge about that person's story, everything changed in an instant. And this is what I want to tell you. Difficult people are often the ones with the most difficulties. Hurt people hurt people. You, you see someone who's hurting a lot of people, and I know that's true, even about the, the story I told earlier. You know, I made it seem like I was just met, but I know I know there's a lot of hurt and pain there. I know that when I'm facing a, a difficult person, I know that there's something that they are struggling with. The most difficult people are often the ones with the most brokenness. The most difficult people are often the ones who have the most hurt and loss and pain and regret in their own life. This is in your notes. Write this down. Before you react towards a difficult person, remind yourself there is more to their story than I know. There is more to their story than I know. And I know it's easy to think it's all about me. It's all about what I'm feeling. It's all about what I'm thinking. It's all about what they're putting me through. But if we can change our, our paradigm, the way we see things, just a little bit and say, you know what? I wonder what they dealt with in life that made this happen. I wonder what they're dealing with, life, with in life. The answer to how to deal with difficult people is to be an understanding person <laughs> and realize that if they're acting that way to you, Imagine how bad it must be for them on the inside. Imagine what it's like to put up with themselves every day. That sounds a little funny, but imagine the torment that they're going through every day. Imagine that the hurt, people that are, are being difficult with you, imagine what they're dealing with. In closing, I just want to say that we all have things going on, on the inside of us. And people are not our enemy. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual. We don't fight against flesh and blood, ladies and gentlemen. We have an enemy of our soul, and people are not our enemies. And when we can, when we can lift our eyes above that and see that this person is not my enemy, this person may be difficult right now, but this person is not my enemy, and I know that they're dealing with something, and the devil is trying to get at them, and it's just, it's just coming to me. We, and we all, every single one of us, have a little bit of that too. We all have that in us. We all have some 
going on the inside of us that we shouldn't be that shouldn't be there. And I want to give everyone here an opportunity to get some things right on the inside because watch this, without Jesus, we're all messed up. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we pray. And we, some of us have some difficult people in our lives right now, and some of us don't even know that we are that difficult person in someone else's life right now. But besides all of that, all of that, with heads down, eyes closed, I just want to allow the Holy Spirit right now to just reveal his heart to you. Reveal what's really going on there. And that while we might not be able to change what's going on in the other person, we can change our own attitude. We can change our own behavior. And we can be faithful. We can be loyal. We can be friendly. We can be the person that we want other people to be. And right now in the quiet of this moment, I want to give every single person here an opportunity to let Jesus into their life. To say, God, I, I need you here. I need you to cleanse me. I need you to wash me clean. I, I know I'm not as close to you as I should be. So if that's you, if, if you know you want to give your heart to the Lord, you know you want to give your heart to the Lord, and, and you've never heard the gospel this way, that, that God really loved you, that, that God loved you just the way you were, and while you were still a sinner, he died for you. While you were still a sinner, he died for you. And if you could get on board with a God like that, with, a, with Jesus like that, the way he cares about you, I'm going to give you the opportunity in just a moment to say, yeah, I'm ready to sign up for a God like that. God of love. God who is love. And for others of you here, you just know where you're not where you should be with God. You used to be close, but you've drifted away a little bit. And you know you're not where, exactly where you should be with him. So the same goes for you. If you want to give your heart back to him and get back on track and get with the Lord the way you know you should be. If I've described you in any way, I want you to indicate that just by lifting your hands. One, two, three. Giving your heart to the Lord. Come on, lift it up. Amen, I see your hand. Amen, I see you. Amen, I see you. And God sees you. Amen, I see you. Amen, I see you. Amen. Praise God, I see you, daughter. Amen. I see you. Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Father, we come before you and we're so grateful and thankful for this opportunity that you're drawing us in. You're drawing us near. And you love us right where we're at. If you believe this in your heart and you want to give your life to Jesus, come on, let's pray this prayer together, church. And let's say it proudly. Let's say it boldly. Say, Father God, I give my life to you. I give you all my hurts. I give you my pain, I give you my sin, I give you everything because you love me, you care for me, and you've been there for me even when I wasn't there for you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me new in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we clap our hands for those five or six people that said, yeah, I want to give my life to Jesus today.